Hi everyone, today I'll be presenting on my project, Technology, Salvation and the In-Between. This is actually taken from a quote by Peter Till, who famously declared technology equals salvation in an interview with the Wall Street Journal last year. After a quick introduction of the technology that we are looking at, namely GNR, we will do a quick forecast of how our future society and economy may possibly look like, and then at the end of it, bring it all back to Singapore and think about what this means for us. The technology that we're looking at is the rise and integration of technological innovations in the genetics, nanotechnology and robotics, in particular artificial intelligence industries, and collectively they are known as the GNR. On genetics, it is the methods used such as synthetic biotechnology to manipulate genetic materials to enhance certain industry processes. Key industries impacted are likely to be healthcare, pharmaceuticals and energy. After many applications of genetics manipulation, transhumanism is one of them, which sees the development of faster, stronger and smarter humans who can live for a much longer time than the ones today can. On nanotechnology, it is essentially the engineering of functional systems at the molecular scale. Key industries impacted are likely to be healthcare, pharmaceuticals, energy, and also defense and manufacturing. Right now, we're looking at a prototype of a nanomolecular factory, which is a desktop factory that can produce almost anything you want at minimal cost. And this is often said to be the apex of nanotechnology. On artificial intelligence, it is the development of computer systems that can think like humans. Key industries impacted are likely to range from manufacturing and education all the way to defense in the service sector. Of these many applications, it also plays a huge role in transhumanism, which sees the merging of humans and machines. So now that we've taken a look at GNR, it is useful th to ask ourselves what makes them so different from our past and present technologies. Number one, invisibility. Now anyone with the requisite skills and tools can tinker with, say, biotechnology materials in his backyard, and this largely escapes government regulation. Number two, decentralization. We no longer see a need for a centrally planned production chains or huge manufacturing plants when it comes to GNR. And number three, unpredictability. GNR as a unit moves extremely fast and even the best scientists today are unsure of their possible ramifications on society. And collectively, this makes regulation extremely difficult. Now that we've had a quick introduction of GNR, we'll move on to now, let's take a look at what industry experts are saying about the future of GNR. I have grouped their opinions according to a 2x2 matrix, with the x-axis depicting the degree of salvation that technology can bring us, or rather, to what extent technology can improve our lives, and the y-axis depicts the degree of government intervention necessary to reach this stage of salvation. Their opinions fall into three main groups. Those who believe that technology will bring us a better life, the optimist, those who do not believe so, the pessimists, and the in-betweens, those with a more moderate view. The optimists believe that GNR will develop at an exponential rate, and key technologies like the desktop nanofactory and bioengineering will give rise to the death of capitalism and transhumanism. To have a better idea of what the optimists are saying, it is useful to look at their predictions for the future. In the 2010s, we expect to see an acceleration in the development of all aspects of GNR, with the decade ending in desktop nanofactories becoming mainstream. In the next decade, we see the completion of the first stage of transhumanism with the human body 2.0, where we see a revolution in the way we eat, the way our body functions, and even the introduction of nanobots into our human body. Also, schools start turning to virtual reality to fully immerse its students in classes. In 2030s and beyond, we see the completion of transhumanism, the human body 3.0, where nanobots are introduced into our brain to allow us absolute control over what we think, how we feel, and even our very personal identity. Also, we may start looking into the exploration of outer space to alleviate Earth's increasing constraints. The majority of pessimists believe that GNR poses existential risk, and hence relinquishment is the only solution. Bill Joy, venture capitalist and co-founder of Sun Microsystems, have said that existential threats and losing what it means to be humans is much more profound and much more important than superficial gains in material wealth and longer health and healthier lives. 
However, within the pessimist, there is also another view that constant technological innovation is unsustainable and we will see the dawn of the new dark age. This is first proposed by Jonathan Hubner, an American physicist, who did a study on the rate of technological innovations in the past 400 to 500 years. His results show that, rather than following an exponential pattern as Ray Kurzweil proposed, technological innovations actually follow a bell curve and we humans have already picked at this bell curve in the 1900s and right now we are already at the tail end of the bell curve and as early as 2040s we will see a negligible increase in the rate of technological innovation. Last but not least, the in-betweens. The in-betweens are mainly concerned with three areas. Number one, decreasing social inequality. Number two, increasing economic growth. And number three, avoiding technology gone wrong. Juan Enriquez is the proponent for social equality, and he believes that people need to be well-versed in the predominant technological language so as not to be left behind, and this has to be done through public education. For a closer look on what Juan Enriquez is saying, when we think of a developed country, we mainly think of the haves, the people who have the skills and knowledge to take part in the new economy. However, if we take a step back, the majority of the people are, belong to the have-nots, those who somehow slip through the cracks in the public education systems and are unable to take part in the new knowledge-based economy. As a result, this will uh, have serious repercussions for social stability and uh, further economic growth. On increasing economic growth, there are two main point of views. The first is proposed by Andy Grove, co-founder of Intel, who believes that outsourcing displaces not just jobs, but also knowledge. In a company, innovation is materialized through manufacturing, which generates a lot of knowledge through experience, which in turn generates more innovation. However, with jobs increasingly being outsourced abroad, what goes along with it is knowledge accumulated through this manufacturing experience. And as a result, in the long run, we see a decrease in the innovative power of a company. The other view is proposed by John City Brown, who believes that institutional changes has to precede technological, economic and social changes. As a result, the government should focus on GNR-specific policies, such as improving and encouraging public education, creativity and R&D, so as to increase the technological adaptation rate in society. As a result, the people as a whole will be better positioned to take part in the GNR industries. Lastly, on avoiding technology gone wrong, the key idea behind this is that it is better to be safe than to be sorry. As Eliza Yudkovsky, renowned American artificial intelligence researcher, puts it, there is really no wait and see when it comes to GNR technologies. Because some of these technologies deal with systems that are more intelligent than humans, it will be too late for us to set down regulations for their development only after the first system is created. In particular, some have gone further to say that state control is actually insufficient when it comes to GNR regulations and the government should increase its efficiency by harnessing the power of other entities in society. For instance, we're used to thinking of regulations in terms of the government sphere in the form of legal policies and guidelines. However, in most societies, there also exists an important silver sphere consisting of entities such as non-governmental organizations and private enterprises. And together, they form a hybrid sphere which can cast a much wider and more comprehensive net of regulations over the GNR industries. Now that we have taken a look at what industry experts are saying about the future of GNR, it is time to bring it all back to Singapore and think about what this all means for us. Personally, I think that in the past, Singapore has kept largely to the optimist perspective, which is that new technologies tend to be good for our society and for our economy, and hence we tend to import certain technologies in fear that the window of opportunity would pass us by. However, I feel that in the future, we might want to take an even more calibrated approach. Because GNR moves so fast and has such serious repercussions for our society, it may serve us well to have a more prudent and comprehensive set of regulations before we actually bring these technologies in. In this way, we can maximize the benefits and minimize the cost brought about by these new technologies.